Welcome back. As we mentioned, obviously, today's announcement by Rand Paul. Well, Hillary Clinton's expected to announce her run this month. No huge suspense, but nonetheless, it certainly is having a domino impact. It all but ensures that Andrew Cuomo will not be running in 2016. But people close to the governor say he's going to follow in his father's footsteps and seek a third term in Albany. Michael Schneerson, who you may have seen my interview with, he's the author of The Contender, he told me he doesn't see Cuomo going for round three. Simply from a, a, you know, a, a political common sense perspective, what else is he going to do? He gets to 2018. Uh, uh, what does he do if he doesn't run? run for a third term as governor? I, I don't think he would have the desire to do that. Well, it looks like candidates are certainly going to be lining up to run against either him or whoever the Democrat would be that would run in his place. Republican Congressman Chris Gibson, he's not running for re-election in Congress, or he announced that. And he's also sounding awful moderate, supporting same-sex marriage, defending the teachers union against uh, changes that Governor Cuomo wants to make. He's also fighting fellow Republicans who are climate change deniers. And it certainly looks as if a uh, person Jessica knows very well here, Westchester County Executive Rob Astorino, will run again, whether it be Andrew Cuomo or the other Democrats. So Gibson certainly would have a primary on his hands here. Uh, and Jessica is the spokesperson for this. It sets up an interesting dynamic, certainly somebody telegraphing literally, it seems weeks, right, Andrew, after he won re-election that, uh, that he wasn't going to run for the another term. The day before State of the yeah. Union. Exactly, announced. right? Thank you. And you're going to have a fighting chance. First of all, before you talk about the primary, do you think, are you hearing the same things that Cuomo seems poised since there's no path to the White House that he's going to run for re-election? No, I mean, in fact, I've been hearing the opposite, um, that he wasn't going to run again. And so when uh, Larry Schwartz came out and said he is running and they did the rebranding of the political committee, I was a little bit skeptical about that. I mean, you have to sort of put yourself in Cuomo mind frame. You know, this budget season was really difficult for him, and you saw for the first time the legislature really challenging him on a lot of issues. And I think it was, be I would like to think it was because people realized how vulnerable he was in this last election. He obviously won, but. Um, I think they needed to send the message that he's not going anywhere. He's sticking around. Don't mess with me too much. I'm not becoming a lame duck governor this early on into my second term. So that is sort of my thinking of what the strategy was. I mean, who knows? He's got mm. plenty of time to decide. But I only think it's going to go downhill for, for him for here. I just don't see, well, I don't see him easily winning a, three, a third term at all. It, it's tough third terms regardless of office. Governor included, I've seen it on county executive levels. I've seen it, uh, you've seen the Bloomberg. same thing. Right, a mayoral, absolutely. If he doesn't run, and do, what's your sense? You he's, think going, he's, de he's definitely going to run. To know Andrew Cuomo is to know that this is about the legacy as it relates to his father. He never forgave himself that he wasn't involved in the, elect uh, the election where Mario, the icon Mario Cuomo went down. So this is almost about redemption. Okay, let me play so pop the author psychology. is wrong. Let me play Pop Frank here. Okay. I also know, as well as you do, but I know for sure that he advised his father not to run again for that term mm -hmm. because of the fatigue factor that every electorate Which has. I don't care how good you are. Redemption. This is about redemption. But he does have to worry, Jessica's right, about exactly what happened to his father. This upstart out of Poughkeepsie that no one knew well, before we even pops get there, up Pataki hyper, hyper, and ran on ABC, anybody but Cuomo, how and about he's this? got the same Let's problem. say he didn't run, okay? Because I'm hearing competing he's rumors as well. He's definitely running. Okay. He, he, he refused to play along. Give me some names here that would emerge if he doesn't. It's not the deepest bench in the world if you think about it. I mean, the, the, the first place you always check is the Attorney General's office, but Schneiderman hasn't exactly had a sparkling profile in, 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 in that. Right? Kathy, <laughs> Kathy Hochul is certainly not uh, in any position oh. and, and doesn't seem to have the chops to, to take him on. You know, then you look to Bill de Blasio, but his stuff probably won't play upstate. How funny uh, would it be if Bahara did? Pre Bahara could potentially yeah. be. You could see a Gillibrand, although. I, I mean, and that would actually make some yeah. sense for her, although she's giving up a secure seat for mm -hmm. a, a less than secure run uh, for Albany. So, or you could see some different county executives throw throw in for it. Mm. Um, okay. So whether it's the governor or named uh, or a person to be named later, um, all of a sudden, I think most people said Rob ran a pretty credible campaign. Uh, obviously, the map's tough for any Republican to win statewide office. Chris Gibson, very serious right now, um, and he's already laying down his markers and surprisingly taking very 
progressive positions as it relates with the Republican Party. He made a point of telling me, Andrew interviewed him too, that I am the most uh, moderate Republican in the House. Look at my record. It'll prove it. How much of a challenge is that, uh, assuming Rob does run here, to win Republican hearts and minds, because it certainly seems like a general kind of platform, but can you win a primary being a moderate uh, as a Republican in New York for statewide office? Yeah, well, not just the most moderate Republican. I think he was named the most liberal Republican in the entire House. But look, I mean, Rob is certainly coming from a position of strength because he's cultivated these relationships over this whole time. You know, a lot of these chairmen, he, Chris is certainly out there, and that's a good thing. He's a nice guy, and we need to have people engaged in building the party up. But there are a lot of people that, you know, got behind Rob early and I think wa want to see him do this again and we're very impressed by but, the but campaign. Make the he ran, but make the argument if a Republican donor know, says, well, Jessica or Rob, I want to win the general here. And how do I win if if my candidate isn't either isn't both pro-choice, pro-gay marriage. Yeah, but, I know you're going to okay. say, well, I'm not going to change the law anyway and all no, the no, rest, but, but still. No, I'm going to challenge the assumption that he lost because he's conservative on those issues. In fact, I saw polling after the election that uh, was completely contrary to that. We didn't lose because Rob is pro-life. We lost because we had $45 million dumped on our heads in negative ads. I mean, and we couldn't compete to that level. Where we did go on TV, we won those counties, you know? And so certainly we have to raise more money if he decides to do it again. That will be but, the key. Richard, let me ask you, I, I, how does Gibson, I mean, are, are you serious about this? I, Nobody knows who this guy is in New York City. Rob Astorino on the Republican side is almost a rock star who did as good as he as anyone could have done up against the 800-pound gorilla okay, and listen, all the money. Uh, you're going to, not because she's here here, so I'm trying not to get hit. I've always said <laughs> Rob's one of the most underrated uh, politicians that there is, okay? And you underestimate at your own peril. Just ask Andy Spano. I'm saying something different. Chris Gibson, he's a vet. Um, he's taking positions that I would argue um, in as blue a state and getting bluer as New York is, you make it at least a debate. If I'm going to write a check here, who I'm writing it for on a statewide race. So uh, he, it's, it's an interesting platform that he's taking. I don't know if it'll win you the primary, but in a general, I can certainly see, even if it's not the dominant issue, it takes it off the table, that you don't have to fight the yeah, social wars. Yeah, but you wars. know what? The Democrats are always going to attack you for, you're gonna, they're going to attack you on those issues well, they're gonna attack anyway. You anyway. They say, oh, you vote for this person if you support. Planned Parenthood is the worst. You could be as pro-choice as they come on every issue, and they'll say, well, who'd you vote for for president? Because if you voted for a Republican, that mean, that makes you labeled anti-choice. Uh, you got 30 so you're before always I go to the Islanders here. Yeah. He's going to spend the next three years going around the state raising money for Republicans and for the Republican Party. He's going to eat into the network a little bit and certainly make some friends in that process, get himself better known in New York City. And if the criteria is an electable Republican for statewide office, He's got a hand to play. I will say one thing really quickly. <clears throat> there has been no candidate with that, that has run without the conservative line that has been successful. And that is always true. is a huge factor in determining who the And you can argue sometimes it hurts that so. candidate come to general. But yes, that's true. All right, I want to get to an issue uh, on Long Island. The Islanders, uh, my Islanders here, they will call Uniondale home no longer after what I hope will be a long playoff run this year, beating the Capitals in the process, Andrew. Nope. Okay. Nope. They will be packing up and leaving for the Barclays Center in Brooklyn at the end of the season, however it ends. And at 7 o'clock this Thursday on Files 1 Long Island, you can catch Farewell to Long Island, which is all about the team's uh, departure and the memories they leave behind. But before we just do the postscript, I have seen buyer's remorse or seller's remorse, I should say, when teams have moved. Remember all the drama in Baltimore after the Colts and owner Robert Ursay moved the Colts to Indianapolis uh, in the dead of night with those moving vans? The city finally built a new stadium and attracted the Browns, uh, fr the Browns from Cleveland, called them the Ravens at the end, and also did it with a lot of taxpayer money. Fans in Cleveland, watch how this goes round and round. They were livid at the city for refusing to build a new stadium. They finally did in attracting the expansion team, and they still were able to call the name the Browns. Still haven't won. I can go around and around here, around so many cities, so many teams, so many sports. At the end of the day, with an island that's got more than 2 million people, 
Do we think they're going to turn around and build an arena for somebody else to bring somebody else here? Um, and all the fight, and I understand why. Why should we build millionaire play pens for guys that already have all the tax exemptions and all the rest here? Why are we here helping them? But at the end of the day, it seems that every city afterwards says, you know, never mind, I'll go in my pocket. And it's good for the economy, too, because you have people coming in, they're spending money on parking, they're buying food, they're maybe sp getting a hotel, is, you know, depending on how far they're coming from. So, I don't know. I think it's a good thing. I think it's, it's good for the pride of the local area and something to do with quality of life. Camden Yards, you can hardly change the yeah. harbor in uh, yeah, Baltimore, right? Absolutely, and it certainly helped the rebirth of, of Baltimore. And you can make the same argument about some of the stadiums in Cleveland and some other cities, Pittsburgh. Yep. Uh, got a big shot in the arm when, when they built their baseball stadium. Look, first of all, with Long Island, the only team that they're going to be able to lure to Long Island are the Islanders because there's three teams in the New York area. There's yep. not going to be a fourth team. I'm a little split on whether to use public money to basically line the pockets of owners so that they can make more money and have their teams be co more competitive. You want the teams to be competitive. And I'm sensitive because my parents were both Brooklyn Dodger fans, and I'm sure they would yeah. have been willing to have the state or the city spend whatever it took to keep the Dodgers in Brooklyn even though that wasn't going to happen. But you get into this high-stakes blackmail game where team owners say, I, all right, I'm making you know 125% profit, but I need to make 175% profit to stay competitive. And they basically hold their fan base hostage mm -hmm. until they get it. And, and somewhere along the line, that trend has to stop. I'm not sure if I would have supported spending public money on Yankee Stadium or on City Field, even though it went mm -hmm. both ways. But for something like Long Island, and I, I think know there's a the value in having it. Wang and the rest really tried, Dominic. Yeah. It's not like they were making money hand over fist. The they lost and money. had the worst parking lot deal that there was in sports and all the rest. But is he right that, you know, these owners are holding a gun basically to the community? His, his argument is right, and I love him, but, but he's wrong. <laughs> and, and the, and the reason why... Is right, but I'm no, wrong. no, I, I, meaning the argument... <laughs> no, I, I've heard that argument time after time after time after time after time again. But... If you're an elected official, I agree with Jessica to a degree on this issue. If you're an elected official, do you want to be the person that lost your professional sports team? Yeah. I know I don't. I, I, I Listen, the, the public can say whatever they want. We can do referendum. We can do whatever you want. At the end of the day, write the check. Keep my team. I'm going to get reelected. Ed Mangano, I, you know, I, he tried all these different things. The Lighthouse Project bungled and all the rest. I have a feeling Islander fans would have said, how much would it have cost us? If I had to do it again, I would have uh, wrote the check to do it. Well, So you would write the check as well? Maybe because I'm a fan. Uh, but, but, you know, there's a lot of people who aren't fans who don't care and say, put the money instead in schools or whatever else. So I, I waver. All right. <laughs> we want you to get involved in our conversation. Head over to Facebook and Twitter and answer our question here. Can a conservative Republican, come back to our first question in this segment, win statewide election in New York? Some people say, hey, look at George Pataki, you know, so it certainly has been done in the past. All right, coming up next, the Boston 2024 Olympic Committee wants the people of Massachusetts to vote on whether or not the city ought to host the Olympic Games. The question, though, is, and it's a broader issue, is it a good idea to have voters make these tough decisions? We're going to tell you about the times that that idea has backfired.